going to press record. We've lost Luke. Should we wait for him? Oh, he's probably just asking the heater. Oh, okay, cool. I'll let <coughs> people. Here we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome to this event. Um, just adjusting my computer here. Um, so, hello everyone and welcome to this event. Um, just, we will be letting a few more people in as they trickle in, but um, I just thought I'd let the people here know that um, you'll be on mute, but um, I've allowed you to be able to chat with anyone tonight, because it's quite a small group. So if you want to personal, personal message anybody, feel free to um, call behind the chats, um, or to send your questions to me um, via the chat function. Um, if you have any questions at any time, you can send them via the chat function. And um, I can ask them at the end, or you can, um, uh, or we can pause in the middle and, and ask questions. It's not a, it, it's a, a nice intimate group tonight, so we don't need to manage 100 people firing questions at us, which is quite relaxing. Um, I think I might just start the event though. So welcome everyone. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on tonight. In this area here, it's the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge that um, we are zooming out onto the lands of many different uh, language groups around the country. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders of the lands that we're zooming out to. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. On that note, um, I'd like to introduce our conversation people tonight. Um, so we have Luke Horton with us. Luke's writing has appeared in various publications, including The Guardian, The Saturday Paper and The Australian, and was shortlisted for the Viva La Novella Prize. The former editor of the Lifted Brow Review of Books. He currently teaches creative writing at RMIT and is a member of acclaimed indie rock band Love of Diagrams. The Fogging is his debut novel and was highly commended for the Victorian Premier's Award for Unpublished Manuscript in 2019. Uh, okay, apparently there's a lot of microphone noise. Yeah, there is a bit. It's coming from my computer. Yeah, I was just scrolling through. It doesn't look like anyone else has their mic on, so I think it must be you. Interesting. Sorry, everybody, for this. Can you hear me at all? Yep. Good now, but it just yep. has a rustling every now and again. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is after I've introduced um, Chloe, I'm going to turn my mic off anyway. So I think I can hear the um, my computer just making a noise, which is unusual because it's a new computer, but I'm going to continue with Chloe's introduction and then I will duck out. So um, Chloe Cooper is a writer, bookseller and assistant editor from Brisbane. Her work has appeared in The Lifted Brow, Overland, um, Peppermint Magazine and others. She is a sales manager at UQP, a very new position, and I'm sure they're incredibly glad to have her. So I'll hand over to Chloe and I'll mute myself. Thank you, Chrissy. So uh, firstly, I just want to say thanks to Luke for being here tonight to talk about his incredible debut, The Fogging. Um, in his book, Tom and Clara, the two struggling academics in their mid-30s who take a trip to Bali for their first holiday in 10 years. Throughout the book, we experience the slow disintegration of their relationship and the unraveling of Tom. Um, Luke, if it's okay with you, I think it would be great to start with a reading from The Fogging. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds fine. So I've just, uh, so I think I just clicked on the chat and all of a sudden you disappeared behind a screen. Uh, but that's gone now. Yep, I can do that. Sure. <laughs> I've been uh, thinking about what to read. I didn't want to do the same reading I did last time. Um, so I think I'm going to read a scene from towards the end of the book, which... Um, yeah, you know, I've checked. I don't think there's any spoilers, although it is quite towards the end of the book. Um, but I feel like it's a kind of representative scene of um, perhaps Tom's 
difficulties um, and perhaps his relationship with Clara and also their experience of being on holiday in Bali. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much I need to say before starting. That's probably enough. They're just going, this is towards the end of their time in Bali and they're going to a restaurant in Ubud. Okay. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. They had gone into Ubud to a restaurant that was hard to get into and which they had booked while they were still in Sunum. It denoted, uh, donated half of all proceeds to setting up schools for Balinese children, employed local youth in the kitchen and had solid eights and eight, eight point fives on the apps. They were dropped off by the shuttle bus and worked their way through the streets. Ubud was very different to Sunur. The streets there were lined with shining white designer outlets, Ralph Lauren, Nike, Lecoq Sportif, and clogged with tourists. Tom was glad for the change of scene and pace. The busyness, the things to see, meant the quiet between them was less noticeable and it gave them more reason to talk in an incidental way. But he was disoriented by Ubud. It had the feel of a city, but he had, he had no sense of how far the streets stretched and where they were exactly in relation to anything else. Were they in the centre of town or was this just one of dozens of strips that were repeated over and over until he hit rice paddies and countryside, bypasses and freeways? It was much hipper than Sunu. The restaurants, bars, cafes piled on top of each other down every alleyway were more like the ones at home than they were like those in Sunu, where they were all rasta or nautical themed. The restaurant, when they finally found it, ran over two tiny rooftops with a landing in between, filled with people waiting for tables. Diners were crammed, crammed into each rooftop, sitting at bars that ran around the perimeter, overlooking the street or around tables crowding the middle. They were young people mostly, 10, 15 years younger than Tom and Clara, in designer active wear, shorts and tops made out of high-tech synthetic material. Although some were dressed up with glittering jewellery, expensive watches on tanned arms, and there was a small contingent of eco-tourist types in mu muted colours, natural fibres and no makeup. Tom and Clara stood in a line quietly side by side and waited for a shouting match to play out between a guy in front of them in the line and the maitre d'. There was a wait for tables, even for those with bookings, and the guy had been waiting in line with his date for half an hour. The maitre d' told them there was nothing he could do. This was the nature of restaurants, especially busy ones like theirs, while the guy was appealing to him with gestures to his date, as if the injustice of a young woman standing out there in the heat might convince the maitre d' to somehow conjure a table for them. After a while, a young woman, a stick-thin American who was half the guy's height and was behind him in the line, piped up and asked the maitre d' why, why take bookings at all if people have to wait so long. And the rest of her group, several other diminutive women, joined in and the maitre d's command of the situation began to look less assured. Just then, a figure appeared above them on the steps, blocking out the lights of the restaurant. With both arms raised in the air, the silhouetted figure leaned down to the crowd, revealing a deeply tanned man wearing an open-necked denim shirt who was beaming down upon them a perfect white teeth smile. He hollered above their voices, hey, 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 hey. People fell silent. Why are we all here, he asked, huh? Why are we all here? The rhetorical nature of the question seemed to throw the crowd for a moment and no one replied. The man let the moment lengthen, but not so long that people had time to recover and say something. Here in beautiful Bali on this wonderful day, huh? He continued to eat, yes, to eat, to have fun, to have a great time like everyone else. That's what everyone here is for. All these people before you came here for the same reason. He gestured to the crowd behind him and turned back. They are eating our beautiful food. We are donating a large portion of their payment for this food to people in need here in Bali. And we have a wonderful time. This is perfect, no? Yes, though we are busy, you might need to wait a little while for the table, but it is a beautiful night here in Ubud. We're all here together and this is a beautiful thing. He raised his hands high into the air again, perhaps gesturing to the night sky, looking back down at them with his eyebrows raised, seeming to wonder himself if there was more to come and finally said thank you and disappeared. The tall guy at the top of the queue said, this is bullshit and walked off. His date followed. 20 minutes later, Tom and Clara were seated at one of the tiny tables where they pulled their seats in tight to avoid bumping into the elbows and backs of the diners around them. 
Despite the limited space on the tables, they were rom romantically set with pink frangia panties and tiny vases, artfully folded napkins and candles flickering in low light. It was cheesy, but Tom thought it would have made for a good time to talk if it wasn't for the cramped space and everything else going on in the room. The kitchen was open to them and not far away, there were flashes of flame and clouds of steam as water was poured into woks, the sting of chili wafting over. But overpowering all of this, dominating everything in the room, was a huge flat screen TV mounted on the wall above them. It was playing Coldplay live in concert at Madison Square Garden or wherever, and it was loud and bright and flashing. Fireworks exploded, the camera panned across a sea of fluorescent dots, wristbands held aloft, it turned out. And as Chris Martin sang one last para para paradise, the music dropped out and the crowd carried the final line by itself. Whoa, 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 whoa. Then Martin in close up on huge screens either side of the stage, let his hands drop from the piano keys, raised his head and closed his eyes, breathing hard into the mic. Tom tried to ignore the film, but it was impossible. The swooping cameras, the magnitude of the whole thing, the spectacle, all the carefully orchestrated moments of communion and pathos. The audience feeling every breakdown, every moment of quiet with a roar. Clara watched too and chuckled quietly at it, but Tom was annoyed. He had felt superior to the whingers in the queue, unable to wait for their seat, who were being like the man had implied, petty in the face of such good fortune. The good fortune of being alive and in such a place and having nothing else to worry about but a table at a restaurant in a town full of restaurants. But now he was losing his cool. It was very hot in Ubud, hotter it seemed than in Sunur, with its sea breezes and open spaces. And it was especially hot and humid in this cramped space. The close proximity to the kitchen probably wasn't helping. And it was crowded, but he was most annoyed about the video, the noise of it and the sentimentality. It made him feel embarrassed by the idea of attempting anything like a serious conversation about what had happened to her or about their relationship or whatever. Plus, and he hated him for it, he was becoming increasingly worried about the shuttle bus. It did rounds the shuttle bus and it would pick them up in front of the rendezvous spot at 8.30 p.m., the latest of its rounds, which was now only 50 minutes away. What would happen if they missed it? Catch a taxi of some sort, he imagined, but he didn't know really. And the drive had taken a while. That could be expensive. And they'd been spending much more than they'd expected on the holiday so far. But he was fighting that, telling himself to stop worrying about the fucking shuttle bus. They would be fine. And he gives a shit about the noise, the video, fucking Coldplay. That'll do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. I love hearing a book from the author's own voice. Um, and what I wanted to ask actually to begin with was I'm really interested in the inception of a book. So I was wondering if you could tell us what was the initial spark for the book? Where did the idea come from and, and what made you want to turn this into a story? Yeah, um, well, I guess the simple answer for that really is that something a little like the central incident of the fogging incident in the book. Um, actually happened to me and my partner on a trip in Bali. Um, and so um, my partner got caught in her hotel room while they fogged the hotel. And I don't know if everyone knows about the story or what that is, but um, that's just a routine spraying of pesticides that they do in holiday resorts, not just in Bali, but throughout the Pacific and various places. And it's pesticides, which like kills off bugs and mosquitoes and spiders and stuff like that. And they do it, you know, every few weeks or whatever, it's a routine thing, but they're supposed to tell the um, guests and tell them to be out of their room when that happens. Um, um, and I get confused now between what happens to Tom and Clara and what actually happened between what's happened with me and my partner, um, Antonia, because she tells the story quite differently. I think she was I don't know, there's some confusion about what she knew and what she didn't know. Either way, she got stuck in her hotel room and saw this smoke coming in under the door. And, and then she went into the bathroom and there was smoke coming in through the louvers. And I think she did know about the fogging as a thing. Um, 
but it's still uh, just a toxic cloud, you know, and she didn't want to walk into this toxic cloud. And so she had this horrible experience of not knowing whether to stay in the room, but it was coming in or to leave. And it was a big hotel grounds and the whole place was covered in smoke. And I was out on the beach and she rushed out and eventually found me. And it was just this kind of traumatic experience. Um, and, you know, that's not quite exactly what happens in the book because I tried very hard to make sure it was fictional. Um, but that was just seemed like a great hook or a great idea about ways of exploring that kind of fraught or complex experience you have holidaying in those places where it's this amazing paradise. But for it to be this amazing paradise that caters to your every need, there's all these things that happen in the background um, and all these things the locals who are basically serving you the whole time have to do to make that paradise possible. And that's the kind of hypocrisy, I guess, and the um, facade of that paradise that you sort of see glimpses into. So I thought it'd be an interesting way of exploring that, but then it was also an idea that I could then try and think who would be in or have a situation, uh, experience like that and how could it be pivotal in these people's relationship? And then it became a really fun kind of um, exploratory project of trying to create characters around the central incident. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also love the way that you used the fogging, well, this is my interpretation, correct me if I'm wrong, but the fogging is a metaphorical sense for anxiety and depression as well and how that kind of comes down on you and confuses you and is quite a toxic thing to live with as well. I'm, I'm assuming that was deliberate and um, ties in with the character of Tom. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... It's hard not to see, um, yes, I guess a title like that as well as having an obvious sort of metaphorical implication. And I think, yeah, that is true. And um, yeah, I think what I wanted to do once I realized I was going to be writing about anxiety and about a character with an anxiety disorder, I wanted to explore how that affects somebody and how it affects their relationships when it's not something they're open about and when they're in denial about it and when they are trying to conceal it from people around them. And so in a way, yeah, I mean, anxiety, to live, live with anxiety in a way is like living in a constant fog because you're so um, preoccupied with not having a panic attack or, um, yeah, you're so preoccupied with, um, you know, your symptoms and keeping it together, that you're never really present in a way that um, people who are not anxious um, might be. And I can see, I think there's still a lot of shame around anxiety disorders, especially or probably particularly for men. I mean, I think it's one of those things where, yeah, mental health issues are talked about more now than ever. Um, and, and anxiety and depression is talked about all the time. You don't only have to look on Twitter for people to be discussing quite openly being on antidepressants and, you know, um, how their mental health is that week or whatever. And that's um, obviously a really good thing. But I think predominantly that's uh, women having that conversation. I mean, I'm sure there are men who are doing that too, but it seems that it is harder for men to discuss all of that. And I think um, maybe anxiety particularly because it's sort of a loss of control and it seems to come from a place of like being oversensitive or caring about things you probably shouldn't care about. Um, and it seems maybe a little um, feminized or something like that. I guess there's a sort of connection with anxiety with like hysteria and panic. And I can see how that can be um, emasculating or seen to be humiliating or something for men. I don't know, but anyway, that's sort of veering off. But yes, I think there's a fogging um, there in Tom's head the whole time of him being just incredibly self-conscious about himself and his interactions with other people and the way that he's appearing to other people because that's what makes him anxious. And so that stops him being like very authentically there or very real with people or very honest. 
Um, and then I guess that creates another fogging in a way between him and Clara, this kind of fog of silence that they have and this fog of misunderstanding, I guess, between them, because she is someone that has her own struggles with mental health. Um, and it was hard for that for me in the book to explore that because it's written from Tom's perspective and he's a little oblivious and self preoccupied and about Clara's struggles, but I wanted to make that clear, hopefully clear to the reader that she's obviously going through her own things, but Tom's just not really present enough to understand that, but still give the reader enough of it to get, get that sense. So anyway, it creates all these silences in their relationships. And so it's sort of a relationship based on silence. And I guess is that sort of, you can see that as a fog, a metaphorical fog too, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's really interesting how it shows how dangerous silence can be as well and how toxic um, for not just a relationship, but just as a person to keep all these things inside and not, and I mean, Tom is an interesting character because he's, he's quite negative and, and with the people close to him, like Clara, he's, um, he's very openly negative about, you know, um, Madeline and, and Jeremy and, and other things as well. And, and yet he doesn't take any of the action. And I think that that is quite an interesting perspective to have for a main character. It's quite an interesting and unique point of view. And I thought that was quite, quite good. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about Bali as a setting as well. Um, that has certain connotations for Australians um, when you go on holiday in Bali. Was that, uh, obviously that was intentional for you. Can you tell us why you decided to bring that? I mean, obviously it stems from your personal experience in having a holiday there as well, but tell us about how yeah. you, you looked at tourism and, and Australians going over to Bali in the context of the, your novel. Yeah, well, <clears throat> yeah, so it's certainly not, as I say, I didn't set, um, set out with a sort of, you know, any kind of um, systematic uh, or um, I didn't set out with my themes or the arguments or the things I wanted to explore. I set out with this sort of central incident and then creating characters around that that were interesting to me and dynamics that were interesting to me. But then all of a sudden, yes, so it's set in Bali and I did find that interesting as an experience to go there and observe all those layers of um, having a holiday in a place like that. And so it seemed like a really interesting thing to explore in a book, I mean, a lot of writers have written about, you know, as in short stories, there's kind of a great tradition of um, people on holidays and, and you know, um, you know, and, and, and seeing that the underbelly of that and the kind of facade of that and stuff. And there's lots of great stories and stuff that, that does that. But it does seem to me that Bali is almost an extension of Australia. It's sort of taken so for granted by Australians as sort of um, where so many people just go in winter. Like you take your Bali holiday and you just hear so many people talk about it as if it's just an extension of... Um, of Australia, it's, it's a sort of quintessential Australian experience, very much taken for granted. And so it's sort of surprising it hasn't been written about more in that sense. Um, so yeah, then I also thought it was actually a really great setting for Tom's kind of agonized experience or like, um, yeah, experience with other people and interactions with other people because he obviously, he has, you know, I, I just think it's a fraught um, and complex experience going to a place like that. You absolutely love it. The people there are wonderful. Uh, the place is beautiful. There's so many things about it you love. You know they're reliant uh, for their livelihoods on your custom and your tourism. And yet you can see what that tourism is doing to the country. And you can see that the lack of infrastructure and stuff like that in the in the country means that they, they don't have great systems for dealing with just like the waste of Westerners and all of that. And you know, Sunur, where this book is set, isn't, um, it isn't, um, oh, you know, the more, um, the more glitzy or trashy side of Bali. It's actually quite a quiet place. Um, and it, the, the locals call it, or, or the tourists call it snore because it's kind of uh, quiet and, and boring. Um, and that's why Tom and Clara go there. Um, and yet it still has all of the, all that sort of friction between being in paradise and yet that 
uncomfortable feeling of being waited on by people. And I think um, it is kind of grotesque to witness so many people indulging in this kind of colonial or just this white privilege of being waited on and really indulging in that rich lifestyle that they can get um, so cheaply at a place like Bali. And, but for Tom and Clara, they're not those kinds of people. They're, you know, they're academics, they're pretty poor, you know, broke, maybe not poor, but broke. And they're, um, and they're kind of intellectuals or whatever, you know, they've read their fair share of post-colonial theory and stuff like that. They're not uh, oblivious to the dynamics and, and the awkwardness of those dynamics of being served by the local people in Bali and the awkwardness of that. And for someone with social anxiety, that's only ever going to be heightened. And so Tom really struggles with relaxing by the pool and being brought drinks and food and then how to respond to the people, the waiters and being waited on in that way. And so I just thought, yeah, that kind of character is a way to really explore the fraught or the awkwardness um, of that in a kind of heightened way or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. And throughout the book, Tom remembers a few of the other holidays that he's taken. So this book kind of does go around the world quite a bit. And it was interesting to read this book during the pandemic when we're no longer allowed to take any holidays. And so I wanted to yeah. ask you how you feel about that, how you feel about publishing a book that's kind of about travel during a pandemic where we're not allowed to travel anymore. Yeah. How's that been? Yeah, we'll see. Obviously, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. You know. <laughs> In the last three years when I've been writing this book, I didn't think this was going, that was going to be the um, conditions under which people would be buying or reading my book. Um, so that was interesting and sort of, yeah, considering that, I kind of wondered if, yeah, I don't know, it could go either way or whatever, but I think people have enjoyed, it almost feels nostalgic now to a time when um, people could do, could do that. Um, so I guess travel just became a theme, but yeah, again, without me really des designing that or kind of preconceiving that, but I think it, for me, it seems like, okay, they're on this holiday. They haven't had a holiday for a long time, for 10, 12 years. Um, and it's that I wanted to tell the history of this long-term relationship. You know, they've been together for 14 years and I wanted some ways to talk about the history of that and the ups and downs in their relationship. And it made sense to me that Tom being overseas again with Clara, because when you are overseas or you, or you are in a different place with your loved ones, um, people close to you, you do all of a sudden see yourself through other people's eyes. You see all your surround, you know, you're exposed to all these other people there. And, you know, you imagine yourselves in other lives. You know, often I guess the cliche about traveling is like, oh, we could move here and we could live here or whatever. And, um, you know, so you have all that kind of evaluating of your life, I think on holidays and imagining other possible lives for yourself. And so Tom's doing a lot of that kind of thinking and reflecting while he's, you know, by the pool, but there's all these things because they did go to Southeast Asia 10 or so years earlier. So it's triggering memories of the last time they did that when they went sort of a gap year, like 10 month trip where they went to France and Germany and and Mexico and um, Southeast Asia as well. And so, yes, you're right. So there's this sort of second uh, subplot or stream in the book where it's all these sort of flashbacks to the last time they were overseas. And I just think it heightens dynamics in relationships when you're traveling together in either a good way or a bad way. Um, and it's kind of reminding him of things that he's been trying to forget about all this time because that's something he does, which is sort of deny and um, block things out that he realizes how unhappy they were last time they were traveling and she basically stopped talking to him and they kind of broke up after spending such intense time together and he's kind of reflecting on that for the first time because he's got a bit of time and space to do that and things keep reminding him of, of that but um yeah i've forgotten what your question was but uh, yeah uh, be, obviously it's been um as as a debut novelist you wouldn't have had publishing experience before to compare to but I imagine that it would be quite not what you expect to try and release a book at mm. the yeah 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 so yes and no I mean I guess in some ways yeah I mean initially I mean it's just a roller coaster of 
emotions, I guess, putting a book out in any condition. So yeah, you're right. You're right. So I don't know how much I've been going through is just what a normal roller coaster of um, putting a book out, debut novel out is, or if it's, um, you know, just made so much weirder because of doing it under these conditions. But yeah, there's lots, lots been going on. So in one, one moment, I'm just terrified, you know, that the whole publishing industry is going to collapse and no one's going to buy books and something's going to happen that makes my book not even come out, you know, or whatever. You have those moments in March, I don't know, when we just didn't know how bad it was going to get or whatever. And you just have those kind of moments of panic. You're like, oh, of course, my book's never going to come out. This was all just a fantasy. This is never going to happen. Um, I don't know. That's probably just um, saying more about me than others. But um, once I got over that, there was a wonderfully heartening response uh, to bookshops, support for bookshops, support for authors, support for the Australian publishing industry online, like on Twitter, and there's all these campaigns about really supporting debut authors and bookshops and all of that. And that all felt really heartening. Um, and I guess, yeah, people were saying, you know, people have more time now, they're at home. And nearly everybody I spoke to in the industry was saying that people as are as interested if not more so um, in Australian books now and Australian fiction and it's a really good time for Australian fiction um, and I mean my experience has been so great putting this book out like the critical response has been wonderful and the reader response has been wonderful it's really exceeded my expectations um, so I can't really complain on that level you know I haven't um you know, I didn't get to do a physical book launch. You know, I haven't been able to see anybody. I haven't been able to go into bookshops and sign books or, but I've, you know, I've looked at book, bookshop windows and taken photos of bookshop windows and um, people have been posting lots of stuff to me, you know, showing me, oh, here's your book in a window or whatever. So all of that's been really lovely. Um, so I feel like I've been very lucky considering, you know, how hard this period has been for so many other people, I guess, you know. Mm. I know for myself reading it um, with Tom kind of remembering his past holidays, it had me thinking back about my past holidays too. And, and although maybe some of his memories were a bit negative, I remembered mine quite fondly and maybe feel like realize how lucky I was to have the chance to do that. Back. Yeah. That was, uh, was quite nice actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I know we've got quite a lot of um, authors, uh, not authors, well, some authors, but writers in the, in the audience tonight, which is awesome. So I thought maybe I'll ask you some, some writing questions. Sure. And I wanted to know, like, what was your process um, in terms of publishing this book? How long did it take you to write? I think you've mentioned maybe three years. And, and what was its development? And how did it come from its initial starting point to, to where it is now? Um, yeah, so it started out, I guess, just because that little idea, I thought maybe I was going to write a short story around it. I thought maybe it would make a really good 5,000 word short story where you get sort of no backstory and you just have these people in, in ho on a holiday in Bali and, um, and you just saw what happened to them in the moment and it would be very, it would be all about omission, you know, what you don't tell people. Um, and I sort of tried that, I guess, you know, I guess that sort of Hemingway thing of it just giving you a scene and you have to sort of then puzzle out who these people are on their background. But I don't think I could pull that off. I mean, I've never really written a short story that I've been particularly happy with. Um, and so then I developed into a novella because I'd written a novella before which got shortlisted for a prize. And I thought, oh, well, that's something I could feasibly do. I had a, um, a baby um, at the time or was on the way. And um, yeah, so I thought a novella, so it went up to sort of 20,000 words and that felt pretty good. And then um, it didn't get shortlisted for, the, for a prize. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not sure what to do with this. Um, I really feel like there's something in this, but maybe I'm just not nailing it. Like what am I need to do? And at that point I sent it to a few friends so I had a few early readers who um, are acknowledged in the book because they gave me great feedback. Um, a couple of different writer friends and an editor friend. Um, and their feedback was really encouraging, which was great. Um, and they really liked it. And I think, 
you know, a, a really good editor, a friend of mine, David Winter at um, Text Publishing, he um, actually said, you know, I think there's a novel in here. I think you just need to keep going. Like you need to keep expanding it. We don't know enough about these people, who these people are, who Tom is, who Clara is. Um, you just need to keep going and expanding it. Um, so that was the feedback I wanted to hear, I guess, you know. Um, so then I just spent, I don't know how long, I've lost track of time really, I guess in the next nine months or something like that, fleshing out out into a novel. And then that I had the deadline of the um, Unpublished Manuscript Award um, for the VPLAs, the Victorian Premier's Awards. Um, and that was sort of my deadline. Um, and I got it in for that, um, but I sort of knew it wasn't fully realized. And it was a bit, then I think I'd gone a bit beyond it sort of become a baggier novel i had this long chapter towards the end which i knew was a risk um narratively um which takes you back to tom's childhood and has this sort of hometown long chapter about his upbringing in this hometown and all of this um anyway so then i got highly commended for that prize i guess and that was very encouraging and then editors wanted to read it um, and then it was, yeah, then I thought, well, do I keep working on it or do I send it out? And I did send it out and Anna Thwaites at Scribe just had a wonderful response to the book and was, um, just everything she said about it. I totally agreed with, and we got along with really well, got along uh, really well. And, um, yeah, so yeah, it seemed clear to me what the book needed to do to become a fully realised book, which was obviously get rid of the sort of baggier chapters at the end that I just didn't need. And then, yeah, so then after that, it was just sort of the editing process, which was what I'd sort of felt like I'd needed earlier, because I, at a certain point in a book, you don't feel like you just, you just lose sense of what is working and what isn't. You can't see the wood for the trees, you know, you don't, you know, I said I could keep working on it, but I might just be making it worse. You know, like I needed somebody else's input. And, you know, I had some good early as reader responses, as I said, but I think I needed an editor at that point. And I found an editor and yeah, that relationship was great. And it really honed it and kind of made it tighter. Got rid of some excess. I wrote a little bit more here and there trying to develop the characters. I guess the technical challenge was, yes, I think what I mentioned earlier, of how to show enough of Clara as a character, even though it's from this sort of self-obsessed perspective of Tom's, how to give you enough of the agency of Clara and what she might be going through, through her conversations with Madeline and Jeremy, the people they meet on holiday, and just through her uh, responses to Tom. And that was sort of the technical challenge of how to get enough of her in the book. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. And were there any particular books you were reading at the time that influenced you or uh, that you held in high regard and wanted to try and emulate in any way while you were writing? Yeah, I mean, yes, yes. And I mean, in a way, it's such a long process when you're writing a book for three or four years that you read so much in that time. So that question's been asked a couple of times and then, yeah, I kind of land on a few different books every time. But um, actually, after I gave uh, a few people the early novella version of the book. A few books got recommended to me and I was kind of glad I hadn't read them before I'd started. But then when I'd read them, I could see why they were being recommended to me. And there was things I got out of that. There's a great book um, by Perec, the uh, French writer, Georges Perec. I'm not quite sure if you say his name, so pronounce his name. But uh, 60s, 70s writer, quite an experimental writer um and he wrote one of his first books was called um things and it was about a couple of uh, mid-30s academics and the kind of disappointments of their lives and their sort of obsession with material materialism with material goods and with possessions and um you know, uh, of achieving the kind of middle-class status that were always sort of out of their grasp. And I, when I read that, I was like, oh, this is what I am sort of doing with Tom and Clara. So I guess in some ways there was books that kind of I read at the right time that helped me feel like I, oh, I should hold my nerve. Also, I read a book by Thomas Bernhard. I read a couple of his books. He's a great mid-century German writer who's just sort of absurd and ridiculous and over the top and really misanthropic um, male protagonists and I guess at some point I was kind of worried I was just writing a kind of 
nasty, uh, unlikable book about a nasty, unlikable person. And you kind of like, or maybe it was a too dark or something. Um, and then you read people like him and you're like, oh, this is nothing compared to some people. This is quite um, mild compared to some books out there. So I think that was good to read, to think, no, there is something worthwhile in this perspective. Um, I guess I was really interested in reading books that maybe have a satirical edge, but then play with that tone with sort of a, that play with that line between a satir, sat, satire and more sober realism. And I like maybe that ambiguity and kind of not necessarily deliberately confusing readers, but making the tone not completely obvious. I think someone who does that well is Michelle de Kretzer, who I like uh, very much, uh, Life to Come. That was a great book. I think she do, does that very well where certain chapters feel like she's lampooning these characters in the quite overt way. These are sort of, this is satire. These are quite ridiculous characters. And yet then they'll have quite more sober, earnest passages. And, um, and you're kind of never quite sure, is this satire? It's lightly ironic and just plays that very lightly and very deftly. And I liked that because I wanted people to have conflicting feelings about Tom and not make it like um, making him a ridiculous character or an overtly sympathetic character, but someone you could hold conflicting feelings about. So I was looking for books that had that kind of ambiguity in their characters. But um, my daughter Albertine's here now. I think she wants to say hello. Do you want to say hello? Sorry, she really wanted to say hi. Do you want to say hello to people? Hello. They're talking about my book. <laughs> Very shy. All right, do you want to go off to Mama? It's nice to see you again, and I'll come in and give you a cuddle in a minute. Okay? All right. <laughs> That's a bit of a segue to a question that we've got from Chris Curry, actually. Okay. Um, so um, Chris has asked about your parenting and it's said not that... about the OC, is it? If What's that? The, if it's about the OC, I'm not answering it. <laughs> No, no. He says, at the beginning of the book, Tom and Clara meet another couple with a young son, Ollie. Did yeah. you find it easier to write about kids and indeed Tom's reaction to Ollie because you're a parent yourself? Did you draw on your own experiences before or after parenthood? Okay. Thanks, Chris. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, my child is three. And when I was writing this book, she was mainly a baby. Um, and growing into a toddler. And Ollie's a sort of four or five year old kid. Um, but yeah, I think as soon as you have kids and they're playing with, playing with other kids, you all of a sudden are in a world of childhood and you're meeting all sorts of children all the time. And so, and then, you know, I've got a um, nephew who's about that age. Um, I've got friends who have older kids um, as well. So I guess all of those children um, and my experiences with being around those children play into it to some degree. Um, and I thought it was interesting. And I guess it's an experience you have before you have kids um, that you are around friends who have kids and you don't really know how to act around kids and you knew them before kids or whatever, but now there's a whole new dynamic because they have children and you're sort of like, oh, you know, how do I make a child like me or whatever? <laughs> there's that awkward moment, I think, that we all have when we're around children um, before we have our own. And Tom's in that kind of moment where he, um, you kind of get the sense, I think, in the book that Clara is perhaps considering having children, but Tom is kind of in denial that that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, and yet the kid, Ollie, kind of wins them all over and he does end up, they all sort of fall in love with Ollie and have a nice time with the kid. Um, and I just thought that was another thing to play with, with Tom's awkwardness was sort of him, you know, showing that kind of warming up to, to being with kids and then realising he was actually okay at it and, and Ollie liked him and he actually had fun and it brought him out of himself a little bit and it made him less self-obsessed and less anxious to be playing with a kid who was very easy, easily kind of responsive to playing games and things like that. And I thought that was a dynamic I wanted to pull out. Um, but yes, experiences of 
parenthood do come into it because some of the characters relate their early experiences of childbirth and the first difficult years. And yes, I was probably drawing on some of my own experiences and that stuff too. Right. Um, yeah. Great. We've got another question here from Bianca um, who has asked, um, do you have anything else in the pipeline is the first part of the question. Anything else that you're working on? Um, hi, Bianca. And um, also, um, do, as an author, do you have any writerly support networks that you've put in place to help your work? So what are you working on and what's your kind of support system look like? That's a good question. Thank you, Bianca, for the question. Um, yeah, so I am starting to work on something. I think I, um, for a little while, um, yeah, I guess it's been a few months now, but it was only a few months ago that I was still working quite intensely on this book and doing the proofing and everything. And then I was teaching and then the pandemic happened. So I think, you know, any momentum I had, had, had has been stalled a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, I had a book coming out and so I've been trying to be kind to myself a little bit about that and be like, you know, now's not the time to be putting a lot of pressure on yourself to, um, to be productive, but it has been strange because, you know, for the last three or four years, I've been quite disciplined and had quite a good writing routine. Um, excuse me. And I was, um, well, I was working on a project that I was really excited about and really enjoying and, and I could tell it was you know, being productive and generative. And every day I had something to work on and revise and new ideas for new chapters. And it was just this really exciting experience writing this book because it really felt like, yes, now I've got something that's really working. And so that's a great moment, a great feeling to go through that and to, it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like you're forcing yourself to sit down because you're thinking about it all the time and you really want to do the work. Um, and that's been, my experience most of the time with the writing. And so now I've got this kind of, I've been in this kind of weird, what am I doing next moment? Um, but yes, the pandemic happened and I'm still teaching and I was like, okay, well, you don't have to start writing straight away. But now it's been a few months and I started to think, oh, it's been a few months. Now I really should be writing something now, shouldn't I? Um, and I've never really had writer's block or anything before. So that was a bit like, okay, I should just start doing you know, just something disciplined, get something down once a week and ideas will start coming. Anyway, this is a very long winded answer. But the, the short answer is that yes, recently I started working on something and it started having that same generative um, uh, feeling where I'm thinking about it all the time and wanting to get into it and wanting to write. And uh, I guess it connects a bit to Chris's question because it's it's more even more so about parenthood and about a man a little bit older than Tom going through parenthood. Um, I'm trying quite hard to not make it a Tom Rides Again type scenario, I'm not trying not to, to make sure it's a different character. It's early days, but I'm interested in writing about parenthood, I think. Um, and that's where it started from. Anyway, it's very early days, but then, Beyond that, writers' networks, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, having the, an editor, which I did with Anna with this book was so great, uh, such a great experience. And I sort of don't have that now. I have friends who are writers and, um, you know, there is a possibility that we could, you know, start sharing stuff or whatever, but I don't have a writing group or anything like that. We, we've sort of tried to set it up a couple of times with friends and I've done it individually with a couple of friends, early drafts of my book. I showed it to a couple of writer friends and got feedback on, but nothing really set in stone. Um, I do think that's a really good idea, but most of the people I know who are writers are just really busy people as well. And maybe they've, yeah, I don't know. So it's hard to get that rolling. I found that difficult in the past. Um, I do like that idea. Um, yeah, so I do encourage people to to do that, to get those relationships. I mean, I, I came out of a writing and editing degree, that RMIT professional writing and editing degree, and that's like a workshop environment. And so for two years, I had a group of people reading my work every couple of weeks and critiquing it, which was confronting. Um, but also just, just improved my work so quickly. And some of the earliest things, there's even a scene, I think, in The Fogging that had its genesis in something um, um, that I workshopped in that class like five or six years ago. So that was a really great experience and I just improved so much over that time. 
but yeah, so if this writer's block um, continues, I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll need to get into a writer's group to try and start one and so we can all encourage each other to start writing. I don't know. I think it's a, I don't think you're alone in this. I think it's a pandemic um, writer's block that seems to be, it seems to be a pandemic of writer's blocking that's yeah. happening at the moment alongside the COVID pandemic. Yeah. So I think Chloe and I were talking about that just before you got on the Zoom. We were. <laughs> Great. So I might um, just hand back to um, you guys for final statements and um, before we open um, the mic so that people can uh, have a clap at the end. So um, thank you both for, um, for being here tonight. It's been a really interesting conversation and of course a very writerly one with lots of people watching who, are, who I can see names that I know very well from the industry. So thank you all for coming. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Luke. Thank you for, for chatting to us today. Thank you so much for having me, Chrissy, and for Chloe for the questions and to everyone else who asked questions and for coming. It's Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've, allowed, um, I've allowed everyone to unmute themselves. So if people want to do a final round of applause, feel free to unmute yourself and clap. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you well, so thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Coming. Thank you. Yay. That's great. Lovely. Um, and you, we'll catch you all on the YouTube at the other end. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Thanks. Bye. Take it easy. Bye. Thanks. Bye.